Hello friends. Today we focus on international capital flows or international investment. Along with international trade, the movement of productive factors have played a significant role in the economic development of countries over the years. Today we will be exploring the types of foreign investment, the motives of capital flow, the factors that affects international investment, the effects of capital flow as well as certain theoretical issues with respect to the foreign investment. Welcome to the video. So these are our topics. We will start with the types of foreign investment. We will explore the motives behind the capital flows and we'll analyze what are the factors behind international investment. We will also explore the effects of international capital flows on both hosting as well as the investing country and we will end up with the theory of international investment. Now let us explore the types of foreign investment. Broadly speaking, foreign investment is classified as foreign direct investment FDI, foreign portfolio investment, FPI, and also foreign institutional investment, FIIs. Foreign direct investment refers to investment in the foreign country in which the owner of the capital do have the control over the investment. That is, it is an investment that gives the investor a control over investment even though this control need not be 100%. It's a direct investment, it's a real investment, it's a business investment which faces the market risks. Examples are purchase of a company abroad, starting a subsidiary or a taking over the control of another firm in another country. You can take it as an example of direct investment. On the other hand, the portfolio investment will not provide a control over the investment. We will analyze the portfolio investment a bit later. There are three types of foreign direct investment. It is known as the horizontal FDI, the vertical FDI as well as the conglomerate FDI. If the investor establishes the same type of business operation in the foreign country as he operates in the home country, it is known as the horizontal foreign direct investment. On the other hand, if the foreign investor starts an activity which are different but related to the business activities which he do in the home country, it is known as the vertical FDI. If the company makes a foreign investment in a business which is unrelated to the existing business in the home country, it is known as conglomerate FDI. That is, if the activity is same, it is known as horizontal. If activities are similar or related, it is known as vertical. If it is entirely different and unrelated to the business which you do in the home country, we know it is known as the conglomerate foreign direct investment. There are both benefit as well as demerits for foreign direct investment. Though the benefit of FDI is that the most important benefit is you will fill the resource gap of the developing countries because capital flow into the country and it can solve one of the important limitations of developing country that there is low amount of capital resources. It also provides the transfer of technology by providing resources, by providing capital, by providing productive resources, it can also provide a growth stimulants to the country. It can improve the balance of payment of developing countries, it can lead to product specialization and foreign direct investment is arguably one of the most important anti-monopoly weapon. But there are certain drawbacks to foreign direct investment or what we can call it as the cost of foreign direct investment. The most important drawback is that the basic motive of foreign direct investment is commercial profitability. It is not aimed at the upliftment of the developing countries. Further, the technology that was brought by the direct investment may not be suitable for the receiving country or the host country, that is the developing country. 
FDA can adversely affect the small scale sectors because they cannot face the competition of the giants or the MNCs. And it can also lead to the concentration of economic power leading to the monopoly as well as oligopoly. FDA can lead to the demonstration effect and can distort the consumption pattern of the developing country. And since the MNC, MNCs are the most important vehicle of foreign direct investment, they can also influence politically and can lead to lobbying in developing country or what we can call it as the host country. From this point, we can shift to the second type of, of foreign direct invest, sorry, foreign investment, which is foreign portfolio investment. As we said, it's an investment in which the owner of the capital or the investor do not have the control over the investment. It is merely lending of capital to get return, in which there is no control over the use of capital. That's why it is also known as a rentier investment. It's an indirect investment. It's a financial investment. Examples are investment in securities, deposits in commercial banks, purchase of bonds, debentures, equities, and so on. Moving to the third type, which is foreign institutional investment. They are essentially portfolio investment undertaken by the institutions registered outside the country where they are making investment. So foreign institutional investment is an investment by an investor of the investable fund registered in the country outside in which it is invested. That is foreign registered companies are making investment in a host country. In India, it refers to the outside companies investing in the financial market of India. And these companies include the insurance companies, the pension funds, the mutual funds, and so on. Companies need only to get registered in the stock market to make such kind of investment. That's why many times we call foreign institutional investment as a part of foreign portfolio investment. Now, by now we, are, we have examined the types of foreign investment by looking at the foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, as well as foreign institutional investment. Now, shifting our focus to the motives for capital flow, and we will examine the motive for both direct as well as the portfolio investment, because foreign institutional investment essentially takes a portfolio route. Start with the important one, which is foreign direct investment. The basic motive of direct investment is to earn higher returns possibly resulting from higher growth rates abroad, more favorable tax treatment and greater availability of economic infrastructure. The motive may be even to attain a horizontal integration, to exploit a unique production knowledge or managerial skill held abroad. It can be to gain control over foreign source of raw materials, or foreign marketing outlets to ensure that there is uninterrupted supply of raw materials at a lowest cost. We call it as a vertical integration. So motive may be for horizontal integration or for vertical integration. The motive for foreign direct investment is also to avoid tariff and other restrictions on imports imposed by countries. It can be to take advantage of government policies to avoid any kind of future competition, future expected competition, and to obtain financing and subsidize loans from the host country. These are the basic motives for direct investment. Shifting our focus to the portfolio investment, there are only two motives. One, it is yield maximization. As we have already seen, the basic motive of portfolio investment is to earn the rate of interest or to it's a rentier investment and the institutional firms as far well as individuals want to earn more and more interest abroad so the first objective or the first motive is yield maximization that is to earn higher returns abroad and the second motive is risk diversification that is they want to have different kinds of as such debentures bonds in different countries so they want to reduce the risk and eliminate the potential risk exposure 
Now, what are the factors that affects the international investment? We can at least identify the seven factors. Now, profitability is the most important determinant for foreign direct investment because FDA aims at profit and the second aspect, the rate of interest corresponds to the portfolio investment because it's a most important stimulus for portfolio capital flow. There are the interest rate differential and capital do have the tendency to move towards those countries where the rate of interest is high. The cost of production is also in a factor that affects the international investment because capital flow is encouraged by low cost of production in foreign countries. As we have already seen that the uh, availability of raw materials, the availability of economic infrastructure do have influence the pattern of international investment. The fourth aspect is the speculation. And basically the short term capital movements are influenced by speculation. Speculation about the future movement of the rate of interest as well as the future movement of the exchange rate between countries. Economic conditions do have an influence like the size of the market, the availability of economic infrastructure, etc. The government policies towards the foreign capital, towards the foreign investors, the fiscal policy of the government, the monetary policy of the government, even the fiscal incentives provided to the foreign investors do affect the pattern of international investment. Political factors like stability of the government, influence the pattern of international investment. Now, what are the effects of capital flow? Capital flow or the pattern of capital movement, international investment do affect both investing country as well as the host country. Arguably, it will increase the national income of both countries, both investing as well as the host countries. And the level of employment tends to fall in the investing country and tends to rise in the home country. Why? Because since there is a flow of capital from the investing country to the host country, it tends to create a situation in which foreign investment tends to depress employment in the investing country and to increase it in the host country as there is a flow of capital from the investing country to the host country. At least in the short run, it will have an influence on balance of payment. In short run, the balance of payment tends to worsen in the investing country and tends to improve in the host country. Because there is a flow of capital from the investing country to the host country, it will lead to more of a capital expenditure in the investing country and a receipt of capital in the host country. Because we do have certain cases. In fact, this was the major contributor of the balance of, cri balance of payment crisis that the United States faced during the period of 1960s. There was massive flow of US investment or massive flow of US capital towards the Europe. In fact, this led to, this led to the restrictions of US foreign investment during the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. At least in the short run, the balance of payment do have an influence as far as capital flows are concerned. Another important influence of capital flows are with respect to the taxes, the tax collection, the tax, the amount of tax revenue that has been collected. Now, these argue that the countries with high corporate tax tends to encourage capital flow and capital flow, capital will move to those countries having lesser amount or lesser percentage of corporate income tax because it's a tax directly on the profit of the companies. And the countries having high corporate tax rate will tend to lose the tax revenue as well. So as a result, the tax base and the amount of taxes will decline in the investing country and will rise in the host country. Since the foreign investment and capital flow affects the output as well as the volume of trade in both investing as well as the host country, it also likely to affect the terms of trade, that is the relative prices in which the countries are trading. However, 
the way the terms of trade will change it depends on a number of other conditions in these two countries. So it's not very clear whether it will lead to an improvement in the terms of trade or worsening of the terms of trade in both investing as well as the host country. So that's as far as the effects of capital flows are concerned. Now we are shifting our focus to the, our final segment which is the theory of international investment sometimes also called the theory of foreign direct investment. The foreign investment decision process is basically a three choice procedure. The first choice is that a firm must decide whether it wants to exploit an existing competitive advantage in abroad or it needs to or it wants to concentrate on the development of no competitive advantage in the domestic market. If the answer of, of if the decision is the first one, that is, if it wants to have an ex, want to exploit an existing competitive advantage abroad, then only the second choice comes up. That means if the choice is to move out or if it want to have a foreign investment, then the second choice comes up. It must decide whether it wants to produce at home and export or production abroad. That is, both are the patterns of international business. If the second aspect is selected, that is, if the firm wants to produce abroad, that means if the firm wants to have a foreign direct investment, then the third choice comes up. It must decide how. If it wants to have a production base there, if it wants to have a joint venture there or if it wants to have a merger there or starting a subsidiary there or whatever be, that's a third choice. We have seen that most of the firms and most notably the multinational companies want to have a physical presence abroad. That is, they do want to undertake an international investment. They want to undertake a foreign direct investment. And the theory of international investment classifies firms as three. The firms as seekers, the firms as exploiters of imperfections, firms as internalizers. Now let us examine what is the meaning of firms as seekers. Firms seeks resources. It wants to have a resources. It seeks factor advantage. It seeks knowledge. It seeks security. It seeks market. That is, firms want to have raw materials, resources, factor advantage, knowledge, security, as well as market. This is, these are the reasons behind the foreign direct investment. Firms as seekers. Now, what is the meaning of exploiters of imperfection? There are certain imperfections in developing country created by the government control of economic activity. One are the imperfections in access. It means that consumers are denied choices. By following a restrictive economic policy, by following a closed economy, there was no enough, not enough choices for the consumers to use. So once the economy is open up, there is always a profit making opportunity for the company. So they want to exploit this. That means the imperfections in access. The second imperfection is the imperfection in factor mobility. And the third one is imperfection in management. Firm wants to exploit the managerial skills available in the developing country. And the third issue is firms as internalizers. That is, the firm rather than merely providing a licensing agreement, firm wants to have a physical presence abroad by establishing their own via foreign direct investment because they want to internalize their production process. There is no effective transmission of knowledge. They want to keep their knowledge, their information, their capabilities, their technology confidential. So to make everything confidential, since the firms are internalizers, they want to have their foreign direct investment in the foreign country rather than rather than having a joint venture or a licensing agreement. This is as far as firms as internalizers. The discussion of international capital flow would remain incomplete 
without examining the role played by the multinational corporation or companies which will be the theme of our next presentation hope that this video is useful to you you can always visit our blog www.skpeco.blogspot.in until we meet next time stay safe happy learning thank you